So let's start with what is the story of Annabelle? The story of Annabelle is about um, uh, Mia, our, our lead character, who her whole life is just like dolls. She's collected them. And her husband uh, gives her, as a gift, a doll, Annabelle. And it's really the, the, the pursuit of, of the demon that has taken over this doll to uh, mess with Mia's mind. And, 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 and go after her soul and it's, or, her, or her baby's soul, depending on how you look at it. And it's her fight and struggle with the, the Stephen. Now, how is this an offset of The Conjuring? It's the really, um, it's just a, 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 it just sets up the opening scene of The Conjuring. It's unto itself. It's an original movie unto itself. However, it's tied because of course, that creepy doll was introduced in The Conjuring in the beginning and near the very end in the Warren's house, you know, was in that wheelchair and head turned, you know. Um, and so it, that's basically how it's tied to it. But it's really, you know, you know it's kind of an homage to uh, the past, uh, like a Rosemary's Baby, a movie, you know, it's timeless, it's classic. It's an homage to The Conjuring as well in style and tone and period. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's a little different, actually. Now, Annabelle the doll is based on a true story, so mm -hmm. how does that add to this? How, how is it the fact that this is a true story in, a, in effect, uh, mm -hmm. have effect on the film that you're making? Well, I think that, that if you start with, first of all, The Conjuring and The Warrens, and they've got 3,000 cases of, you know, paranormal things that they've, they've uh, investigated and trying to sort out for people, you know, half of them are fraudulent they're, they're not you know but there's a half of them that that the people that are involved in those cases including the Warrens researching them and helping them uh, believe are real very real and and so I think that when when people um, believe something can be real it, it's will scare them more I, I think that you know I thought about this a little bit and if you think about like vampire movies um, Guys think vampires are cool and girls think vampires are sexy. But do we really believe, anybody really believe that vampires exist? I don't think so. But they're more than willing to be entertained by a, a vampire story. Well, the same here. However, because of religion and because, you know, everybody wonders what happens to them and their, their soul or whatever you want to call it after they die, there, many people believe there's something on the other side. Now, once you have an audience that goes there, then you have a wonderful opportunity ma to manipulate them and, and scare them. Now you and uh, James have worked a lot in the past. Truly. Did you have the same vision for this film? Like was working together, was it the same vision? Oh, there's no question about what I learned and, and even kind of helped develop with, from and with James, who's the master in our day. Uh, of horror, I believe, and I'm you know proud to be. I've always been at his side. Um, oh sure, I mean there's a there's a certain formula that we, uh, we on our first movie uh, we together experimented with, uh, which was a good movie. But um, it really wasn't until Insidious One that I think what I called the real experiment. Um, where, you know, for on a very low budget, uh, you know, sort of framework, we got, we had this incredible story that Lee and he came up with and Lee wrote, and we got a chance to um, hone our horror skills, I would say, on that movie. And what came from that movie actually really inspired The Conjuring and how it was done. It was just a much larger, larger scale. But uh, those techniques are techniques that, of course, I incorporated in, to Annabelle. And um, part of it is, you know, setting the tone, the period, the time, which immediately, it's interesting when you, it's kind of cool that these movies are set in this 1970, 1975 in that zone. Because with music and, and with the look, people get sucked into the film right away. Then, now you got them, hopefully. And if, if you do, now you can start to really mess with their minds and, and um, 
you know, as long as you have the kind of stories we have and you have the actors we have, and, and then you set them in a, the key is to set them in a very real environment. Even though it's back then, you just, the more realistic you make it, the more believable it is, and the scarier it is. And that's sort of what we set up in, in Insidious One and carry through The Conjuring. And there's, you know, more things we could talk about specifically that accomplishes that, but that's kind of the general way to start it off, if you will. That's good. Now, I understand there were some strange things that might have happened while shooting. Can you talk well, about any of those? you know, there, there's one specific thing that was kind of weird towards the end that, you know, you could say what you want. It was, you know, coincidence or whatever, but when our demon Joe was on the set, uh, Eric, um, I'm not sorry, not Eric, Chris, Chris Shaw, uh, Fuller, who's unfortunately... He's not in the movie anymore, and, not, and his character was amazing, but unfortunately, for whatever reason, editorially came out, but he was he was just walking uh, underneath the lamp, a ceiling lamp, and Joe walked by, and he, the moment he walked by, it just fell right on his head, and it, it was just like random, completely random, but there's something else that happened that most people don't know about that I thought was kind of interesting, because the apartment we were shooting in was, uh, at the Langham, is a penthouse. Um, in, in Koreatown, in 8th and Normandy, it's called the Langham, and um, uh, the, it hasn't been inhabited by anyone. Nobody's rented it for 15 years, okay? But it used to be Clark Gable's apartment when he was hanging out in L.A. It was Ronald Reagan's uh, apartment when he was an actor. But since then, it has been rented, and they say, oh, it's, you know, kind of haunted or whatever. Okay, believe it or don't believe it. But um, the first night I went in there with, with Jimmy, a cinematographer, and... Um, and Bob, our, our um, uh, production designer, um, there's a transom windows above the regular windows, and in the design for our movie of the demon is it was three fingers and three talons. And there's, we look up, and there was a full moon. I swear to God, Jimmy had his still camera because we were taking pictures of the apartment. There was a full moon behind the transom, and there were three like, not scratches in the glass, but three fingers pulled down through the dust. And it was, and the moon, full moon right behind it. I got a picture of it, and that was kind of creepy. That was just kind of a little bit of a, you know, a sign, <laughs> whatever. Who knows? That's great. So, what can audiences expect when they see this film? I think they can ex expect to get entertained first of all, mm -hmm. which is what it's all about. Uh, my dad told me that. <laughs> he uh, he was right. Um, that's the most important thing we do. It's entertainment. So there's that. I think they they should be prepared to uh, uh, be scared. Uh, to be creeped out for the possibly the hair on their arms to go up a little bit for to hold onto their seat because they may jump a couple of times but also just to be in, in, involved in a kind of a, a very suspenseful I think movie fantastic